Hi, my name is Vin Joy, and I'm here on behalf of Ange and along with my colleagues to give you a brief overview of ASC 326, Current Expected Credit Losses, also known as CECL. This is the first part of our CECL series, so please be on the lookout for additional videos related to this topic. Please note that this is intended to be an introductory course and has been prepared for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for tax, legal, or accounting advice. Before making any decision or taking any action, you should consult a professional advisor who's been provided with all the pertinent facts relevant to your particular situation. In this first video, we'll be giving you a general overview of the new standards, including the following topics. So, after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, the FASB set up to revise existing GAAP in order to recognize potential credit losses on a more timely basis. Although this was started with the intention of gearing the guidance towards financial institutions with specific financial assets, the guidance was ultimately set up to cover all industries. The resulting guidance requires companies to consider both quantitative and qualitative factors for past, present, and future circumstances that could affect the collectability of any financial assets that are recognized at amortized cost. What this results in is a new standard that recognizes credit losses when the corresponding asset is originated, which differs significantly from legacy GAAP. Similar to legacy GAAP, CISA will still require an analysis of potential reserves for credit losses, but the steps in doing so will change. The steps in establishing a CISA reserve are to first form separate pools of financial assets. The key here being that the established pool should share similar economic characteristics. It's important to note here that the company cannot default to setting the reserve at an individual customer or invoice level, except in cases where the, there are no other financial assets that share similar risk characteristics. Also, the company should be reconsidering the risk characteristics of the pools at each reporting date. Once the company has established its pools, they will then need to evaluate the historical losses, current conditions, and a reasonable and supportable forecast of the future economic conditions to establish a loss rate for each pool. We'll go into this in a little more detail in some later videos. The resulting allowance should reflect the estimated credit loss for the lifetime of the corresponding assets. This should be updated continuously throughout the reporting period. The company should be sure to, re to report the calculated allowance on the financial statements, including the related disclosures that we'll cover in a later video. One last item to note here is that the company should have established policies on when to record write-offs of specific balances. I mentioned earlier that the purpose of the new CECL standards was to have companies recognize their credit losses in a more timely manner. This is done by having companies recognize their estimated losses when the assets are originated, rather, when, rather than when the company believes that the loss is probable. It's important to note that a CECL reserve will replace the probable threshold as CECL reserves will, will establish a reserve at each asset pool, irrespective of the current probability of such losses. Although this is a more conservative approach to estimating credit losses, it should provide companies with increased flexibility in establishing their reserves as there is more subjectivity in setting up asset pools and related loss rates. Although the new standard was originally intended to address issues with credit losses related to financial instruments held by financial institutions, it actually impacts all financial assets that are measured at amortized cost. This includes each of the assets that we have listed here, including cash equivalents, trade receivables, contract assets, held to maturity securities, related party loans, notes receivable, loan commitments, certain financial guarantees, a net investment in sales type or direct financing lease held by a lessor. Now, CECL does not apply to financial assets accounted for at fair value, as the standard is aimed at assets recorded at amortized cost only. This therefore also excludes available for sales securities. Additionally, there are two scope exceptions built into 326, which include loans and receivables between entities under common control and not-for-profit entities pledge receivables. For non-SEC filers, the new standard is effective for reporting periods beginning after December 15th, 2022, meaning that the company must transition to CECL on January 1st, 2023, if they're on a calendar year-end. It's also important to note that unlike many of the other recently adopted standards, 
This is also effective for interim reporting periods as well, not just for 2023 year end financial statements. As companies start to adopt CECL, it may be relatively common to note this, that the ending reserve balances may not differ significantly from reserves under legacy GAAP. It's important to note that despite the ending result, all companies are required to go through the adoption process and update their process documentation. When a company calculates a CECL reserve that is different from their previously reported reserves, the company will use the modified retrospective method. This means that the cumulative effect of the change in reserves should be reflected as a component of opening equity. We provide some resources here that can be of additional assistance for you and your company as you adopt the new CECL standards. Please be on the lookout for additional videos from Anshin that will help assist you as you adopt these new standards.